Hi, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition, our 40th edition of Inside Talk. My name is Dustin Smith, and thank you for taking the time to join us today from wherever you happen to be logging in from. For those who may be joining us for the first time, Inside Talk is our monthly virtual event series designed to educate, inform, and inspire future travel. Here we connect with our wonderful partners, tour architects, and Talk tour directors from around the world to give you a small taste of what to expect on tour with Talk. Today, we have the great honor of being joined by Ken Burns and Dayton Duncan, Talc partners and award-winning filmmakers. In over 40 years of filmmaking, Ken Burns has produced over 40 award-winning documentaries, beginning in 1981 with his film, The Brooklyn Bridge. And just over the last five years has debuted four productions, The Vietnam War, Ernest Hemingway, Muhammad Ali, and Country Music. His films have won 16 Emmy Awards and been nominated for two Oscars. As both a producer and a writer, Dayton Duncan is a longtime creative partner in Ken's filmmaking. Among their collaborations include Mark Twain, The National Parks, America's Best Idea, Country Music, and of course, their most recent feature, which premiered just two weeks ago, Benjamin Franklin. Dayton is also the author of 13 books. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. You are all on mute. Um, if you do have questions, please type them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We have dedicated time after the interview for guest questions, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Many of you also have questions about your upcoming travel and are probably wondering about tour specifics. Please know we will not get into that during today's discussion. Please call our team of reservation sales counselors or visit tuck.com slash health for all the latest information regarding ongoing travel updates. The presentation today will last roughly one hour and is being recorded and will be available for viewing tomorrow afternoon on our travel blog, the Tauker at Tauk.com slash blog. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to turn this over to another very special guest, our very own Tauk president, Jennifer Tomba, who will be conducting today's live interview. Jennifer, please take it away. Um, so I am just absolutely thrilled to welcome Dayton and Ken today. Um, I'll just pick up where, where Dustin left off. Uh, Ken has produced, oh my gosh, it's hard to keep count sometimes, Ken, of uh, over 40 award-winning documentaries. It began with the Brooklyn Bridge in 1981. It includes baseball and fittingly in this week of national parks and national parks America's best idea in jazz. And just in the, over the last five years, I mean, talk about prolific, right? Ken's films that have debuted on CBS are the Vietnam War, Ernest Hemingway, Muhammad Ali, and country music. Uh, Ken's films have won 16 Emmy Awards and two Oscar nominations. Dayton, uh, his longtime partner and another great friend of mine, I'm glad to say, is both a producer and writer. He's, as I mentioned, Ken's longtime creative partner in filmmaking, and he among his many films and books um, as a producer or writer includes The West, Lewis and Clark, Mark Twain, the National Parks film again, The Dust Bowl, Country Music, and of course, Benjamin Franklin. And uh, it seems that he, uh, uh, we're having a little bit of sound issues. So we're gonna just uh, work on, I think there's, we just got a chat in that we have some sound challenges. So we're gonna check on that for a second. And Dayton is the author of 16 books books. Okay, um, I'm just going to ask because uh, I think all of us here on the panel can hear one another, but I think maybe out there in the universe, in the Talc Zoomiverse, um, there might be some sound issues. Um, can anyone just tell me if, okay, a few folks, it looks like we do have sound, so I'm just going to continue where we left off. Thank you, everybody. Overwhelmingly, we've got sound. All right. Uh, <laughs> Our good. host is rebooting his computer. Okay, so, and Dustin will be back in just a second. So I I am, uh, let me just pick up there and say how honored I am to welcome Ken Burns and Dayton Duncan with us today, um, both as business partners. And I'm so honored to say dear, dear friends. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really fitting that this week is National Parks Week because it was back in 2009 when the National Parks America's Best Idea was broadcast on PBS that we realized that there was a great opportunity to hopefully unite Ken and Dayton's amazing storytelling of America 
with Tauk's nearly 100 years of exploring the United States. So we developed a three-pronged partnership with Ken and Dayton, and that's called Ken Burns American Journeys. And together we've developed new itineraries, we've launched exclusive events that Ken and Dayton have spoken at, and we've produced uh, short videos, we call them vignettes, more than 150 of them to be shared exclusively with our tout guests on our Ken Burns trips. And as you'll shortly see, as we get into the Franklin discussion, which I hope you've all watched, uh, has, they, they're full of insights and great commentary and exceptional storytelling and those little secrets on so many topics ranging from the national parks, the Civil War, uh, Vietnam, jazz, baseball, country music, and so more. So, and, and so much more. So as our guests travel with us, they get treated by those uh, insights and vignettes from Ken and Dayton. 15 of them alone uh, can be seen on In Freedom's Footsteps, which is crafted actually with Ken and Dayton, one of the tours we put together together, and covers some of the stories of Benjamin Franklin in his adopted city of Philadelphia, which is just behind me. Um, and before we talk Franklin, I just have to say again, you all have taught me more about American history than any book, any movie, any years of schooling that I've had. And I'm so grateful to have you here and be part of all of this. So um, we'll just get right into it, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. We're so oh. happy to be with you, Jennifer. We love you and adore you. And we don't do this thing. We don't venture outside our own work for anybody, well, uh, just for you. Thank you. Thank you. It means a ton to us and the whole team here, I can tell you. And I know our guests adore their trips. And uh, are, are so glad that we can bring them all to life in some small way to the, try to do justice to the work that you so gracefully and artfully do. So Ken, I'm going to start with you. You know, American history is your proverbial oyster, right? You could pick any single topic that you wanted to and make a film on it. You're so prolific. How did you decide, why did you decide to do a film on Benjamin Franklin? You know, it's funny, as, as you get deep into a project, in this case, that took many, many years to make, you forget sort of all of the things that moved it from being an idea to being something that you say yes wholeheartedly to. A lot of it had to do with the friendship I've had for many years with um, uh, Walter Isaacson, one of uh, Franklin's biographers. Uh, and, and it was sort of his persuasion that sort of worked, but it was also wanting Dayton to be on board and more importantly, sort of feeling in here that this was a subject. And I think, uh, as Walters said in that in that little uh, teaser, he's the quintessential American. I, I think in some ways now, as we get past the broadcast of it and this remarkable experience of working together with a team in COVID, you know, remotely uh, trying to make a film, that he's the most important of our founding fathers. I mean, you can make an argument for Jefferson, and we have, and you can make an argument, as everyone should, for George Washington, and it's not to take away from any of those, plus Madison, plus Adams, plus the others that are significant to it, but more of who we are today, more of the best of us uh, is embodied in Franklin's strengths, embodied in Franklin's weaknesses, embodied in the way we are now. He's the most fluid of the founding fathers. Everybody else seems a little bit stuck in what they are, but he was so passionately interested in so many different things. So omnivorously um, curious about the world, but also himself. So he had a kind of Socratic know thyself and it was constant improvement. So when you found a failing or, or something, you, you see that he catches back up to that and, and somehow doesn't completely do it. He doesn't exonerate himself for a person who is, you know, very much about individual relationships and that kind of the beginning of a civic connection begins with two people. Uh, he's kind of gets pretty bad marks for the family life. Uh, but at the same time, he's, you know, moves from being, as, as we said in that teaser, you know, an enslaver of human beings. Um, and you don't want to let somebody off the hook because they're household slaves. One is the same as a hundred. It's bad. Um, he ends up at the end of his life, not only uh, the head of an abolition society, but proposing to his invention, the United States of America, a resolution introduced the idea a petition uh, that, that they outlaw slavery. It doesn't get anywhere, um, but it, it basically moves the argument from something unspoken to something that is 
constantly spoken and until, which is so interesting about your tour is you'll go to Gettysburg, which is the apotheosis of the unspoken part of that, you know, not, not, not dealing with that, that issue. So he's just, I mean, he's the best writer, American writer of the 18th century. He's our first humorist. He's the greatest scientist in the world of the 18th century. He's a great inventor, but he holds those inventions without patent. You know, he's this late revolutionary, but boy, when he's a revolutionary and, you know, no, no, no Franklin, no victory in the revolution. Cause if you're at Yorktown and you're standing there and you've got 9,000 regulars who are dressed in uniforms and armed, thank you, Dr. Franklin, for the French support that you got. And you've got an almost equal number of French soldiers, thank you, Dr. Franklin. And more importantly, you've got a French fleet out there that's blocking Cornwallis's escape. That's it, that's our victory. That's what, that's what seals the deal. And without him, you might have a guerrilla war that's going on for a long time, and maybe you create a United States, but I don't think so. Hey, Jennifer, you're all Yeah, here. I'm all good. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we, I want to dig a little bit more into his foibles and accomplishments in a minute. Um, but before we go there, I'd love to talk a little bit about putting this film together and where you learned all of this <sighs> incredible insight about him. And could both of you speak to what the process was to make the film? How long did it take to write and then produce it? And you're bringing things to life that for which there is no film, right? There, there's just images, or sometimes even just paintings, or a uh, an image of, of Franklin on a on a chamber pot, or something like that. <laughs> well, I'll let Dayton do the talking, but just suffice to say that your challenges sort of grow exponentially when you're dealing with a subject in the 18th century, because there are no photographs, and there are no obviously footage, and we tend to eschew reenactments. So we have kind of modest and impressionistic things, but we're not interested in, in kind of vamping with, with, with that sort of stuff. Um, and so it, it, it represents a huge pro, uh, producing challenge, but the basic thing is the, the, the sort of the terminus where you've got to digest all the information about him and then bring it out in a, in a narrative form. And that is Dayton, that's that, his, you know, he, he works, we've got ideas, uh, David Schmidt and I, the co-producer with me, we have ideas, other, other folks on our team have ideas, but it sort of goes through Dayton and gets, goes through a, a, a process and then comes to us in, in, a, in a big gigantic form. I'll let him talk about the process, the time and, and all of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for the process for Benjamin Franklin is the same for the process for every film that I've written um, uh, to work with Ken on. Um, I just, you know, I have, the, I have the best job in the world, for, at least for me. You know, I get to um, immerse myself in a topic um, or a person um, that... Uh, I find, you know, either I'm already excited about it or I know I'm going to be excited about it. Either way, I get to, I, my job is to read everything I can about this person. Uh, in Franklin's case, to read everything I can by that uh, person, uh, to digest that, to start thinking about what the storyline might be. How do we, we are, Ken and I are, uh, are old fashioned narrative storytellers. We believe that history is best taught, best remembered in the old fashioned way that began all discussion of history. Someone stands up and tells you a story and that's why you remember. It's not a, it's not a list of names. It's not a, uh, an, you know, a list of dates. It's a story um, and it has characters. In this case, there's a principal character, but there are other characters as well. So, you know, you just read everything you can uh, about it. You take notes and then you try to figure out, okay, well, where does the story begin? Usually in a biography, it's a good place to begin with someone being born, but, uh, and usually it's gonna end, not to give it away if you haven't seen the film, but he dies at the end. Uh, but anyway, so it's just a, it's just a constant, uh, returning. The thing I love about my work with Ken for 30 some years now is his belief that the word 
is so important to to the to our 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 style of storytelling. It images are crucial. The music is equally important. The interviews uh, that uh, we conduct with people are absolutely critical, particularly in uh, this case when there are no uh, uh, images to speak of. But it's how do you put the story together? And that is something that at the outset, um, as someone who's written 13, not 16 books, now you've just made me feel like I've got a lot of work to do, uh, Jennifer. But um, you know, the writing is not necessarily a collaborative enterprise at the uh, at the outset. But what I love about my work with Ken and the incredibly talented people that he's assembled at Florentine Films is that I can present this to them knowing that it's way too long. Mm. Uh, there's more stories than we can fit into four hours. There's more digressions than will probably make sense. But the together then, um, we can fashion it into a story that makes sense, brings you along, and yet hopefully keeps all the, the nuances and complexities that we think are so important in, in telling the, the story of, of, of this nation that we both uh, love. And the 4th of July is a holy day for both of our families. But what is remarkable about it, and Franklin is right at the start of it, is those magnificent words that began our nation set us on a journey, on an experiment, as Franklin would say, to can we live up to those, those goals? And, and we certainly haven't all the time, and we still haven't done it. But that's what's interesting. And it doesn't detract from that being a worthy goal. Um, and so anyway, that's, uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a process that uh, we both believe in very strongly. We put the film together, we watch it, we then tear it apart, put it back, have the editors put it back together, watch it, tear it apart, do it. And uh, we take longer than most filmmakers do for that reason. And, uh, and I love that portion of it, yeah. you know? It's, you know I, I, I don't consider my uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, or 10th draft uh, written in stone at, uh, on a mountaintop to be brought down and, mm. and presented to people. It, it can always be made better. And if you're working with talented people who have that same goal, uh, you just, you know, you just got to do it. It's, it's, that's the work. And the, for me, that's not work. That's what I love. I want to pick up on that word you said about interesting. And then the years that you studied Franklin Dayton and I'll also put this to Ken too, so you can think about this question. What was the most interesting or perhaps amusing or unusual thing you learned about Franklin? I mean, you've been studying American history your entire life and all of a sudden you're going, wow, I never knew that. What, what surprised oh, you? Oh my Everything. goodness. Everything. With, Benjamin, yeah, with Benjamin Franklin. I mean, I, I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. So, I mean, I walked past different statues of him every, every day of uh, four years of my life. And I knew some things about him. I, obviously, I knew that he founded our university. So uh, that was not a, a, a new thing. And, but I, I think the thing that was most astonishing to me is not, there wasn't one little thing. There were so many little things. It wasn't, this guy has so many angles in his personality, but even more overpowering than that were all of the interests that he had, that he threw himself um, into. And, and it wasn't that he th just threw himself into a lot of things. He was exceptional at everything mm -hmm. that, he, that he tried. I mean, it, you know, whatever, whatever that new interest is, he became, if not the best in the world, one of the best in the world. I mean, and so, which is the key to him a little bit. Um, you know, he was a polymath, which everybody knows, somebody knows about everything. Most polymaths are not like him, an autodidact, that is to say, self-taught. You know, he got to be a polymath by teaching himself, by his own... Mm whatever that there was. And then as Ken used the word, he was had an omnivorous, uh, omnivorous mind. So he decides, well, I'm gonna get involved in 
uh, civic. I'm going to I'm going to try to be successful. He was immensely successful as a printer and a publisher. I'm going to teach myself how to write better. He was the best writer of, in America in the 18th century. He was hugely successful. I said, I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to set that aside. I'm going to devote myself to civic things. So not only does he do that, well, he starts a university, first libraries, the American Philosophical Society, little things that improve, uh, other minor things that, not minor, but little improvements on things. He, I said, well, I'm, now I'm interested in science. He was a Nobel caliber, caliber scientist who then put that to work for the betterment of people. Then he decided to involve himself in politics and brought to that, you know, a genius and a perseverance and a personality that uh, changed the course of, uh, of the history of, uh, of our nation. I mean, so I, I don't, you know, you take any of those things and I'll say, I didn't know this, I didn't know this, I didn't know that. Here, the main thing I will add, if I don't want to take much longer, but because we might want to deal more with that. I did not know that this most, one of the most renowned revolutionaries in our firmament of founders, first of all, didn't start out wanting to be one. Mm. And secondly, that his son, William, became the royal governor of New Jersey and was as renowned a loyalist and as denounced uh, a, a loyalist as his father was a glorified um, patriot. I, 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 I didn't know that. And that, that to me uh, was really fascinating and I think um, illuminating to me. It also illuminated to me how much the revolution was a civil war more than just, you know, armies that you right. know, fighting one another. Every family, every city, every county, every church had people on both sides. Yeah, I, I think that's it, Dayton. It, all of that stuff comes as a tsunami of, of information and digesting it is, is just so overwhelmingly delicious to do. Yeah. Um, there may be a way, Dayton, pointed to it as an autodidact to understand it. Uh, you know, his, his parents want him on a Harvard track and they can't afford it. He's lower middle class, if that. And um, family of candle makers in Puritan Boston. And he goes to two years of elementary school and they can't afford it anymore. So that's it. So uh, as the scholar H.W. Brands points out in our film, uh, schools teach you what you should know, but they also teach you what you don't have to know. So Franklin didn't know what he didn't have to know, so he decided he had to know everything. And if you begin there, then everything that comes at you becomes part of this remarkable curiosity. Um, and and it's, it's a scientist's curiosity, the, the testing of things. It's the Socratic uh, you know, curiosity, who am I? It's the civic one, who are we? What, what's our purpose here? How do we work better? It's the political one, it's the, it's the inventive one, it's all of those sorts of things. And so, you know, doing a project like this, we don't tell you what we know. The last time I checked, that's called homework. We share with you our process of discovery and it is as flabbergasting to us to accumulate all the stuff that you see in the film. And then of course, a lot more because we've had to make these judicious cuts um, that, that makes him so remarkable. And, and we've, we, you know, from the very beginning, we've insisted in our own work that we're not gonna be a sanitized Madison Avenue sort of view of this, that this is warts and all. And in fact, in some ways, understanding and having access to his failings makes him human and not a statue. And, and you begin to appreciate that much more who he is because he's got stuff like we've got. He just happens to be, you know, as Joe Ellis says in the film, he's an everyman, but he's a really remarkable everyman. <laughs> because as Dayton was saying, everything he touches, he perfects at the highest level that human beings on the planet perfected that. And that, that still is with us all of the things you could do a through line from his discovery of electricity through all sorts of things like 
the, the X-ray and the theory of relativity to how we uh, in epidemiology uh, figure out how to do vaccinations. He's dealing with inoculations back then. I mean, there is nothing about Franklin that feels in any way trapped in some powdered wig, waistcoat and breeches era. He is as modern as we are. He speaks our language, this American language in a way that you just, you're sort of shocked that he sounds like and is dealing with um, what we're dealing with. He just writes so much better than any of us, but Dayton. <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's, it's just a remarkable gift to be able to spend some time with him and then equally exciting to share it with the world as we've done and to see the response, which is always, I had no idea. And that's, that's what we get, familiar topics, whatever they might be, but you know, this season it's Franklin. Um, and, and that's what you live to hear. Like, what more could you know? I mean, for me, I have to admit that I, I don't really remember, but I probably thought that the lightning had to strike the kite, right? And it doesn't, <laughs> you know, it's a different sort of thing. And when you get past the superficiality of all yeah. of that, then you're into some really exciting territory. So on that exciting territory, my goodness, he's a complicated, complex man, right? I mean, even at the beginning of the film, you talk about his discovering these 12 and then ultimately 13 uh -huh. virtues yeah. that was going to lead yeah, him yeah. to this That's... moral perfection, right? Temperance, silence, frugality, sincerity, moderation, chastity. Oh, yeah. And then humility, which yeah. someone reminded him he might want to add, right? And he was surprised, he said, to find myself much fuller of faults than I had imagined. Um, you just you talk about so many of his foibles and so many of his challenges and so much of the every man perhaps part of him and that sort of darker side that sometimes doesn't get the light and i'm i'm wondering what what did you what does that teach us about who we are as americans as you as you well, often say well i just think that we take the onus off because nobody's perfect right i mean um, someone asked I.F. Stone, who was a, a, a terrific journalist and historian, uh, one of his acolytes said, how could you possibly admire Thomas Jefferson? The implication being this is a person who owns slaves. And he said, he said, because history is tragedy, not melodrama. We live in a melodramatic age. In melodrama, all heroes are perfectly virtuous. All villains are perfectly villainous, but it, it's a tragedy. Life's a tragedy. None of us get out of here alive and none of us are perfect. And so it's not, we all have dark sides. It's just that when you're a big larger than life figure, some of those things get pronounced or more importantly, the rest of the world discovers them in the way the rest of us are able to conveniently hide them, right? And so in Franklin's case, the ownership of slaves, the difficulty sort of living up to many of his ideals with his own family, um, many, many things. I mean, he's also in a good way, the author of the compromises that create the United States, but those compromises are incredibly tragic for uh, populations, uh, you know, the three fifths clause is is basically mm. how to keep the southern states in in this fractured disunited set of former colonies and they do and they're kicking the can uh supporting union and not the values that that we articulate in the declaration um so it it's complicated but they're not at all disqualifying melodrama suggests that anything is disqualifying and if you live in a melodramatic age, then you have a kind of poverty of spirit because you're missing heroes. And the Greeks have been telling us, you know, time out on your perfection business about heroes, right? Achilles mm -hmm. has his heel and his hubris to go along with his great strengths. Heroism isn't about perfection. It's about how a person negotiates the strengths and the weaknesses. And what's so remarkable about Benjamin Franklin is this endless curiosity and self-improvement, his willingness to try to escape the specific gravities of the things he didn't do so well. And when he proposes, he's given the great honor of making the motion to propose the, the adoption of the constitution in, in 1787 in, in Philadelphia. And, and his speech is so beautiful because it's saying, you know, 
it can't be perfect. You know, we, we've done a really good job here and it, it'd be as close as perfect. But whenever you assemble, he says, men you, of wisdom, you all inevitably inherit their prejudices and their local mm. interests and their passions and their problems. So he sees human engagement as not some on off switch, not some binary function of a media culture in which you're, you know, you're there or you're not there. It's, it's that you have to actually engage with other people and compromise and hear where they're coming from and understand that you must bring with you the same kind of baggage, negative and positive, that that other person, you know, whose features you can see a lot clearer than your own. My ancestor, Robert Burns said, uh, you know, uh, oh, oh, it's some gift, the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us. I mean, Franklin got that. And, and so this, mm -hmm. this proposal to adopt the constitution is this incredibly moving thing about essentially human foibles. Now, you mm -hmm. know, if you're gonna give him a grade, you know, he's, he's A plus in lots of places, but there's a failing grade in the, in the family department. But even in the, in, the, in the question, the main American question uh, about race and slavery, he's moving and he's moving in the right direction and he gets on the right side as Erica Dunbar says. And, you and know, I think you, the, uh, the thing that, that I really um, and hope we brought out um, in, our, in our film about Franklin, one of the things that I found fascinating about him is his honesty, mm. his <clears throat> his just open willingness to admit when he has found himself, he goes to a school uh, for black children that he helped get founded in Philadelphia, but he comes away from that saying, I went there and I discovered that these black children are just as smart as the white children. And he said, you know, I almost hate to admit that, but there you, there you go. I mean, there was, you know, I, I can't account necessarily for all my prejudices, but I'm willing to admit them. Um, and his son William was from um, was from a, a an affair of some sort. We don't mm -hmm. nobody knows uh, who it was, but he brought him into his common law marriage with with uh, with Deborah um, openly. You know, uh, he admitted and you know admits that in his parts of his youth, he would, uh, what was it, uh, uh, dealings with low women. Uh, we kind of can understand what he's, you know, know what he's talking about there, but you know, there, there he's, he's, you know, he's, he's saying it. Um, and his honesty about humanity, uh, knowing that uh, he's got faults, and everybody's got faults and let's just, and as Ken said, what can we do to improve on it? And he was dedicated to that. And of course, as only Franklin could say when they pointed out that he forgot humility in his list of, of moral uh, perfection, um, he, in discussing it, he only said, it's pride is the hardest vice to rid ourselves of. You can try to strangle it, you can try to smother it, you can try to ignore it, but, but there it is. And he said, even if I could finally conquer pride, uh, I would be probably be proud of my humility. I mean, you know, <laughs> so that is both, you know, a brilliant writer uh, and a nice line, but it is true. You know, it is true. You can't get rid of it. Uh, you can try as hard as you can, and if you and if you thought you got rid of it, uh, you by the act of being proud of your humility, you would just slipped right back. You know, in in, in his many successes, right? He, that pride was probably reinforced. I mean, when you that, look at that trajectory that you so eloquently speak of, from being a printer's apprentice, printer's apprentice to the most popular man in Paris, being a scientist, being an inventor, uh, you know, it struck me as he's moving into his time of diplomacy and then his incredible civic work, life expectancy, the average at that time was your mid thirties. And this gentleman lives to be 84. <laughs> so he is constantly reinventing himself and sees this great success. What do you think the real key of that was? I mean, clearly he could have sort of closed the book at any time. And I guess he tried at one point and said, I'm kind of done here in France. And they're like, Congress is saying, no, 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 you're going to stay on. But what do you think kept him going so long? 
Well, I think that that's, it's, you know, you can go back to that I.F. Stone's tragedy, the obvious one being that we, none of us get out of here alive. If you combine that with his omniscient and omnivorous curiosity, then you've got, there's always something new to learn. And that's the key to it. This is, this is the big thing of the United States of America, folks. They did not say life, liberty, and property. That's John Locke. Mm -hmm. They said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And happiness did not mean, I am sorry to say, the pursuit of objects in a marketplace of things. It was lifelong learning in a marketplace of ideas. And there is many, there are many of the founders who are about that in every way, shape or form. Benjamin Franklin is the epitome of that. That is to say that the thing that spurs him on is the idea that tomorrow there's something more to learn. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's about science and anatomy, about electricity and the ocean currents. Maybe it's about human affairs and civic things. It's about education, say, of, as Jayton said, of, of, of the equal opportunity. Maybe, maybe it's the fraught relationship with Native Americans and the way in which they inspired his own sense of there, there could be a unity of America. Uh, and at the same time, kind of the petty and acquisitive nature of, of many of those founders who were looking for land deals from the king and, and would therefore dispossess those native peoples of the lands that they still were clinging tenuously to. Maybe it's uh, about revolution and diplomacy. I mean, he wants to, he's, look, I got your, I got your money for France. You know, let me come home. I'm an old man, right? I'm 75, you know, come on, let me come home. And they're saying, no, no, no. And it's so interesting that the way he handles the negotiation with the French is in totally passive, foot off the accelerator, right? Drives, uh, you know, Adams crazy, right? But he gets everything he wants and more, right? And then now you have to now you have to negotiate the Treaty of Paris with the Brits, and he is like just hard as nails, and it's the most lopsided treaty in American history. I mean, we get everything we want. The Brits get nothing, and the French, who are supposed to be a party from it, are excluded, right? And he has to go back and apologize to the French, and he does eloquently, and also ask for more money, which he gets you know, bankrupting Louis the 16th and his people have already been infected with the ideas of Franklin because he's brought along a little printing press at his place in Paris and he's putting out, he's talking to the court of Louis the 16th, he's talking to his ministers, he's talking to the elite of Paris and he's talking to ordinary Parisians and they get the bug. They get the freedom, you know, uh, a bug. And uh, that is not really good above the neck for Louis the 16th. And, um, you know, it's, 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 I think it's just waking up and, and wanting to know ever more about things. And that's, that's what we all know. Um, the people who attend your tours get that. It's, you know, the, the, it, it, it is the thing that keeps you vibrant is, is that next thing, finding out that thing that you didn't know that you needed to know. Yeah. I think, I think in part of it is whatever it was in him, this, uh, you know, omnivorous curiosity uh, that led him to be a scientist is key to understanding him and many of the things he did, particularly particularly with his role as a, as a founder. You know, science doesn't say, okay, now we know this and we're done, right? You gotta keep testing it. Maybe, maybe we're not right maybe this, or here's a new bit of information, and maybe that upends what our assumptions were. He was always, always curious about that and wanting to, as an enlightenment figure who believes that you can improve, as a scientist thinking everything continually has to be, everything is an experiment meant to try to test whether your theories are right or not. He conjoined those those things in a brilliant way that were expressed in the into how our government was formed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't realize. You know, I've often before I thought that it was probably I was probably plagiarizing Benjamin Franklin, but saying that we've been embarked for two hundred and fifty years here on an experiment in democracy. 
that it's not a foregone conclusion that this will always work. And that's all, you know, I've always believed that part of the journey is trying to Im Im improve things, to, to help us reach those <clears throat> goals that he helped Jefferson express in the Declaration of Independence, that that's, that's what this is all about. And it's an experiment. And when we think that it's over, we're over. And he, that was, that was him. He was still experimenting. He got back from France. He was an old man, you know, crippled by gout, had a new story and a half library built for himself in Philadelphia. Couldn't reach the book. So he invented a long handle like thing that he could reach up and it would clamp on the book and bring it down. Wanted to read in a rocking chair and it was hot in Philadelphia that summer. He invented a thing that by rocking back and forth, it would propel a fan to keep him cool while he read the book that he had reached up with the invention of his to take from his bookshelf. So, I mean, as Ken said, every day is a new day. Um, and that, boy, I, I, you know, that's the kind of life you wanna live. You know, every day is, as John Muir said, you know, it's the morning of creation. Morning of creation. creation. Well, I, I will, I want to turn it over to some, some, uh, there's a ton of questions coming in. I will tell you that both you and everyone on the chat is going to live to be 150 because of the curiosity and the self betterment <laughs> and the desire to learn that just permeates certainly from the amazing work that you all do and, and the questions that so many have. Uh, before I turn it back to Dustin, I do want to ask this. So some of our guests, whether they're on In Freedom's Footsteps, uh, a tour that you designed with us that will start in Philadelphia, or perhaps they're in London, or perhaps they're in Paris or walking the streets of Boston, they're going to be walking in Benjamin Franklin's footsteps. And what do you think that our guests might want to keep in their mind about the great Mr. Franklin as they walk those streets? You know, that's a wonderful question, Jennifer. I, I think that we've discussed it. It's, it's this idea that where I am now is the moment that I'm in, and I have certain responsibilities to that moment. But I am also, um, this moment is also the, the result of all the previous moments. And so if you're in Boston, where he was born, a Puritan city, he was restricted uh, a lot by that, by family limitations, by his indentured servitude, one step below a, stay, a slave um, to his brother, um, to the Philadelphia journey, to his life, and to, to England, that we're aware of the fact that as empty as that street we're walking down, it's filled too with all of the lives that have been there before. Mm. And I think that that you know, it's very hard, particularly in partisan days, to talk about our present moment without the mm. kind of the disintegration of the comedy, which is essential to getting things done, the civility that is necessary to make the kind of improvements that Dayton is suggesting in this ongoing experiment. History is a table around which we have an opportunity to at least share a past in common, that we can agree on some set of facts, maybe we interpret it a little bit differently, but we can, we can begin to do that. And, and I just think that Franklin offers us an opportunity uh, back to the glory of us, not just the US, but, but that intimate sense of, of us in connection. And that, that's what he was all about, that that end of that summer, the doors were thrown open and someone asked him, what have we created? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. Hmm. And that's a, a, a charge to all of us uh, that, you know, when we see how fragile um, that experiment has become, it's nobody's fault but our own. And that we're now um, all have to be Franklin all have to be open to other ideas, all have to be good listeners, all have to be good at expressing, have, good at, at sort of being able to forge compromises that do not compromise the institutions and the possibilities of the United States. Everybody now seems to be a melodramatic, independent free agent, right? And mm. nothing happens there. There's, there's only ruin at the end of that story. There's only disunion. Uh, at the end of that story. And so we can actually be recharged wherever we might be uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, by the by the example of Benjamin Franklin, not because he is a perfect human being, but because he reminds us to address our own imperfections and to be curious. I would just add one of the things, <clears throat> Jennifer, that both of us um, love so much about our partnership uh, with Talc is because um, one of the things that we that we enjoy or are grateful for of the films that we make is that it prompts uh, you know uh, people to say I want to learn more, and one of the ways that I can learn more is to go to those places where the story that I just watched on your film took place, whether that's mm -hmm. a national park or Gettysburg battlefield, downtown um, Independence uh, Park in Philadelphia, uh, you name it. I always have believed that a place of geography, I'm a Midwesterner, I spent more years traveling, just driving around the United States, trying to learn its history uh, than I can count. But I always believe that uh, a piece of uh, a, a specific location exists not only in its coordinates of north, south, east, west, latitude, longitude, it also exists in layers of time. Right. Mm. And when I've been to places where I've visited that or gone there to, to research things, as I looked into those layers, it made that place come alive to me in ways that I, it wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and so, you know, when you go to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, you know, there's layers there, right? Not only was it where these magnificent documents that, that began our own uh, national journey took place, um, Meriwether Lewis sent a prairie dog back to President Jefferson from the far west as you know when he was on on the Lewis and Clark expedition there and and the president sent it up to Mr. Peel's museum which at that point in time in the early 1800s was the second floor of Independence Hall you know and that uh, <laughs> there's Meriwether Lewis before he went west came to Philadelphia uh, to get the equivalent of his college education was the same as mine from professors at the University of Pennsylvania, what became the University of Pennsylvania uh, in, in, in uh, different things. So you walk down that, you know, those cobblestone, what were the cobblestone streets and uh, luckily in Philadelphia, some of those places are so wonderfully preserved. We held the journals of Meriwether Lewis in our hand, which is a wow. weird magic moment, uh, at the American Philosophical Society, a couple doors down from Independence Hall. Um, Where the first draft of the declaration is, too, is with all of these corrections. A, a, an organization begun by Benjamin. Benjamin Franklin. It was his idea to have that place. I mean, so... Um, I just think the uh, I just and I I know this because I've been on some trips with with you and your and your folks. That's what prompts them to come. Is they, you know, Philadelphia is a great restaurant city, and it's got some pretty nice museums and stuff. But to um, connect it to our story, not our I mean Ken's and my story. I mean our story of, of a nation. Man, that's that's a different trip altogether, isn't it? I mean, it sure you know, uh, and I, that's what we um, that's why we uh, so enjoy our partnership with you guys. Well, as we do you, I, I have to tell you, I miss you both enormously <laughs> and I miss this conversation. And I, again, have learned so much from you. I can't thank you enough. And I know our guests are so lucky to be out there and, and walking in your footsteps and hearing your stories as they travel on our journeys. And we'll try and, and do you justice. Um, I know we have just a few minutes left. Um, I know there's been, the, the, the chat has been on fire with, with questions and Lightning Dustin- round. Dustin, I know Dustin has the has the uh, difficult task of trying to sort through a couple of them in the in the last ten minutes that we we'll have. We'll try so. to be briefer. Okay, no, no, please. This is always uh, great. Yes, thank you. And I'm trying to keep up, and I'm trying to pull out some themes from what people are saying. So we touched on it a little bit, Ken uh, and Dayton. Um, 
but if Franklin came to life today, if he was here with us, what would he think about our current divisiveness and whether or not we've kept our republic? Well, you know, I think he'd see this as a moment of great worry and concern, and he would be greatly worried. He would not be surprised by a lot of stuff. I was asked by a reporter, you know, he would, what would he think about social media? And, uh, you know, uh, as if it would be some anathema to him. And I'd say he was social media. He was <laughs> Apple and he was Google and he was Twitter and Facebook all at once as a printer and a newspaper man and a publisher of books and, uh, you know, uh, all the all the things that he was and a postmaster, you know, he controlled the flow of information. I do think given his scientific thing, he'd look at the web and he'd say, you know, the web in nature is a place where you get stuck and then you get killed. I think that's what he'd say. And I think he'd be <laughs> very concerned that we'd lost touch with a kind of civic mindedness, this, this willingness to compromise, which was at the heart of, of his whole being and to, to conduct civil discourses, which we've forgotten about that. So I, I think he'd be, he'd be um, very concerned and, and we'd, he'd, he'd make us sit up straight and think twice about what we're doing right now. And education was a big thing for him, education of everybody. And I think what happens is, is that we've lost control of it. And so if you don't have an educated middle class, if you don't have an educated populace, you end up becoming more like peasants. You become superstitious. You become uh, invested in conspiracy. You become uh, sort of in a way, uh, you, you've, you've limited your possibilities. And I think he'd be very disturbed by the way in which the you know, facts aren't facts anymore. And he'd be just freaking out that people would be having the same sorts of arguments that, that we had had that he had had or watched us have, uh, and even in more venal ways. Thank you, Ken. Dave, anything to add or, or should we move on to another one? No, you can, you, uh, okay. you, you, he, he saw this as an experiment. He wrote to, to Washington, the first president of the United States in 18, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1779 or so, that he thought that things were moving along pretty, say 1789, things were moving along on this new thing that they'd created, that it seemed to be off to a pretty good start. He said, but then again, a lot depends on the people who are being governed. In other words, he said, it's still up to the people. It's a republic if, you'll, if you can keep it. And so that's, that's, where, uh, that's where he'd be coming down now, is that, you know, we got some problems here. Uh, we have to join together to, you know, to fix them, but it's, it, nothing's guaranteed. Great. Thank you. Uh, this one might be difficult or easy to answer, but it came up a lot. Uh, what, and it, what is an example of a story or a fact about Mr. Franklin that you had to leave out of the film? Oh, well, how <laughs> much time do we have? Yeah, 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 yeah. You, oh man, Justin, you asked the wrong problem. question. Right, name, name one. Name one. <laughs> this is Dayton's. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will. I will name. I will name one. It's a fun. It's a. It's a funny thing. And you know, I. I, I preface it by saying I've got these lists of every film that I've made with him. <laughs> he knows that I've got got it, and I know that there are things too that he, you know, that he let me put in because he just didn't want to put up with me whining and everything but um, <laughs> but I also believe that the that the final product is uh, as Franklin would say about the constitution it may not be the best but it might be yeah. that we could do together you know and and that we do that in that's in that spirit and and so there are things in the films that Ken's got his own list that you know he gave it gave in to me and probably wishes still that he hadn't and uh, but in in Franklin, when he was uh, when he was getting going in France, uh, their rumors started. He was so famous as the man who had tamed lightning and had invented the lightning rod and all these things, uh, you know, national, uh, internationally famous for him. Rumors began that he was working with the French, that he was designing these uh, series of mirrors that would be placed on the English Channel that would incinerate the British fleet. <laughs> also, he had a thing that he was making that would fit in a pillbox that would be, could be smuggled into England and blow up Parliament. You know, had these 
weapons of this mad mad scientist. Um, and he never, for all I could tell, he might have originated those. I don't know, uh, but he certainly didn't uh, go out of his way to uh, to say, "Oh no, I'm not doing those things." He, he was sort of uh, uh, enjoying it. And I thought that was a comment on his on his fame, and also, uh, as Ken alluded, um, conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. They were, and, and, and they in were my very case, active. In my uh, defense, because those are all great things. Yeah. Uh, too many notes. Right, so no, we're, I, we're just. I, I, that's, that, it's not a complaint, but the yeah. answer: Are there things that, that don't get in? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah lots of I stuff. Mean, we have forty to one shooting ratio, right? Yeah. Lots of stuff not there, and all the stuff that's not on the cutting room floor is good. And if that had gone in, something else would have had to go out. That's we're working in a right. confined space that you know you can't you can't just balloon it like a balloon. It's got a confined space. Once you decide that that's the, the length, right? Well, we're almost getting close to time. I want to see if I can squeeze in two more. First, um, what's next? What are some upcoming films um, uh, for you that's, that are coming so I, out? I can run down the list. We got a lot that are going on. This fall will be a three-part, six-and-a-half-hour film called The U.S. and the Holocaust, exactly what you think it is. Um, and, I, and we won't work on a, on a more important film than that film. Uh, the year after that, we have a film that Dayton has written uh, called The American Buffalo, um, which is a very, very beautiful, beautiful and, and, and interesting story. Uh, we're working on a history of the American Revolution, a big, massive series, also in the 18th century, obviously. Uh, we're doing a history, uh, our first non-American topic on Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we're doing a film on LBJ and the Great Society, and we're doing a film called Emancipation to Exodus, uh, treating that much misunderstood, the most misunderstood period in American history, Reconstruction, backing it up to the extension of emancipation and taking it all the way forward to the beginning of the six decade long Great migration of African Americans out of the South and a couple of other projects in which we're collecting footage on and have yet to sort of announce that yes this is a film but uh, all of those are are ongoing and and um, wake me up at 4 30 in the morning <laughs> great well that's sounds like you're busy we're busy um, through, the, through the decade <laughs> <laughs> we'll end on this one because I don't want to um uh, not bring up that this week is National Parks Week, and you both have spent an immeasurable amount of time in the parks. Uh, so I wanted to just end with one, one fun question. What, what is your favorite park or a favorite moment within a park? Well, mine are always tethered to parks, one on each side of the country. The first is Shenandoah National Park, and the other is Yosemite. Um, I, when we began our project, besides the battlefields, which are not national parks, they're national park service sites, national battlefields and other things, I felt that I hadn't been in any park until I had gone to Yosemite, which to my mind is the most beautiful park in the universe that I've seen. And um, while I was there on the last night, I, I woke up and remembered that when I was a little boy, when my mom was dying of cancer, my dad took me on the first and only road trip we did together. And that was to Shenandoah National Park, a much more modest in the con context of Yosemite and all the great beauty there, but no less important. And I think as Dayton believes too strongly, you can be standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon, looking at the Precambrian Vishnu schist uh, that is you know, that the Colorado River reveals. That's nearly half the age of the planet itself, and it's a grand geological library. What Dayton was talking about, the layers of time as well as the geographical components, as John Muir called it, a grand geological library. Um, but at the same time, it really matters whose hand you're holding there. And so to me, the, the national parks are spectacular. You know, President Obama is out uh, working on a film right now. His seminal experience uh, as a young boy was traveling with his mother and his grandmother through the iconic Western parks and becoming more of an American, but it's very much tied to mother and grandmother and sister. And it, it's, it's a... Um, 
it's a journey that all of us have to take. And we're so, so very fortunate that this is the, this idea was born here. It comes out of everything that's good about us as well as Stegner called it and gave us our subtitle. It's America's best idea that the most beautiful places on our continent would be set aside, not for Kings or royalty or the very rich, but for everybody and for all time. And the fact that we're all co-owners of it requires only one thing is to get out there and make sure they're being taken care of. It's the Declaration of Independence applied to the landscape. Uh, my uh, uh, facile answer always is uh, my favorite national park is whatever national park I happen to be in <laughs> at the moment. And that's, and that's both flip and it's also true. Because true. Uh, there's so many and they're so great. The one that's embedded in my heart, as Ken has alluded to, is the place that uh, I first went with Diane when uh, when we were courting. So it was the first time she'd been in the West, and I got the great experience to take her to Glacier National Park in the northern border of uh, Montana, and it was a special moment uh, for the both of us, and that was also the first park that we took uh, uh, the the uh, the result of that courtship, <laughs> our two children, uh, when on the first epic trip that we took them for two weeks to as many national parks as as we could get to, but that was the first one we took them to, uh, and we had Im you know imperishable uh, memories from that. I think the national parks are. The one of the great things about them is because they preserve something as as well as 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 they can, that it's a safe place to to you know to to place a memory because you can go back to that place as I have that I saw when I was a kid with my parents, and then with my kids. And I can imagine it looks just like it did in my memory, and in and and pretty much in 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 truth. And I can imagine, therefore, them with their children, remembering mine. It sort of, it, it expands and collapses time simultaneously. You can feel eternity passing through, and you can also just be so vividly focused on that that place well thank you so much Dayan. that's a great a great way to end thank you Dayan. thank you ken uh for your time thank you jennifer for uh hosting this discussion for us um and i did just want to close with one quick slide um if you are interested in our ken burns american journeys please please visit talk.com backslash ken burns uh, some of the featured journeys we have there are up for you. What we've spoken about in Freedom's Footsteps, where you can relive the days of Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia, America's Canyon Lands, where you can explore Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park, among many others, and uh, New Orleans and in, in Mississippi River Country are uh, uh, some of our favorites. So again, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your time and thank you all out there for joining um, and uh, happy travels. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Ken and Dayton.